should start. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, let me say that it's a great pleasure for us to have uh, Professor Fuad Aleskarov giving us two lectures on choice models. Uh, you know, Fuad is a professor in the Faculty of Economic Sciences and Mathematics at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. He is also uh, the director of the International Center of Decision Choice, Decision Choice and Analysis. And let me say that um, you know Fuad has done extremely important work in decision theory and social choice, and um, uh, you know he is one of the pillars, uh, you know, of, of, of perhaps what we should refer to as this or Russian school of economic theory. And it's a very great pleasure. Uh, you know, the pandemic has had many disadvantages, but one of the advantages has been that we have been able to uh, have the benefits of such a lecture um, with participants from, uh, I, I think, uh, all over the country, all over India. So, uh, so Fuad, uh, please go ahead. So, um, uh, so one more thing, I mean, uh, you can ask clarifying questions uh, during, the, during the talk. Uh, Fuad has said he'll be happy to answer and we can have some discussion at the end of his lectures. Okay, okay so, uh, you know, uh, thanks uh, Fuad and uh, I think you can begin. I will stop my video now. Thank you very much, Arunava. And uh, this is for me really a great pleasure to give this lecture in India for India. Uh, because I love your country, I knew it, uh, the culture of India from my childhood, so it's a really great pleasure. Okay, for today, uh, uh, I, uh, according to the request, I prepared two lectures on choice models. It is just the very basic uh, things which are used in many, many fields, in decision theory and microeconomics, etc. And naturally, it contains not only basic things, but also new results, um, which was uh, 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 I, um, <clears throat> in our school was obtained, and uh, uh, some of them are really very recent. Uh, even uh, uh, last year, I will talk in the next lecture. And so let's go. Please interrupt me any minute when you wish. And first, I would like to start from the very important question. How does a human being choose? What is motivation of choice? And this is a list of uh, people who did a lot of work on this, naturally not mathematical works, but uh, first of all, uh, John Hobbes, uh, famous English uh, uh, scientist, he said that people choose to maximize their power. Jeremy Bentham and John Priestley, John Priestley, you know, he was uh, discovered oxygen. Uh, Jeremy Bentham is one of the corner figures, uh, top figures in the uh, philosophy of 19th century. He, they told about maximization of happiness. In 19th century, John Stuart Mill, again, you see one of the top people in economics, first time told about the maximization of utility, and then Wilfredo Pareto introduced the concept of ordinal utility. And I will go through all these concepts uh, accurately later. And so what do we see here? We have here utility concepts and concept, and it splits to ordinal and cardinal, classic ordinal, and von Neumann's uh, utility theory, on lotteries, but uh, I will not touch this topic today um, and even tomorrow. Okay, so we have, uh, what I will talk about, I will talk about finite set of choice, okay? In fact, many things here, which I will tell you, are uh, also, uh, are working also for infinite uh, sets of alternatives but by introducing some uh, additional concepts, some topologies, etc. But I will not touch it because you see general ideas in finite sets are understood very well. So we have a set of alternatives. What is it? 
Yeah. Can you see the cursor? Yes. U is a utility function. P is a is a binary relation. Introduced by De Morgan in 1864. And what we say is that we introduce the preference relation, which says that XPY, this preference relation, this binary relation, means that X is better than Y. And the question which was stated by um, Wilfredo Pareto first uh, was the following. Uh, suppose we have utility for me, for instance, utility of X is higher of the utility of Y. And I would like to represent this very difference by this preference relation, in which case we will have equivalency. What kind of properties should P satisfy this preference relation to have this very expression? Which means that X for me is better than Y, if and only if utility of X is greater than utility of Y in which case it holds. The answer was given by Schroeder partly and by Georg Cantor, sorry, it is not 1985, it is 1885. Uh, Georg Cantor is considered one of the top mathematicians of the end of 19th, beginning of 20th century. And the answer was the following. P has to be, uh, must be weak order which means for a finite set, this is my utility, uh, X, the alternatives are split into the groups and inside each group, these alternatives are, uh, I'm indifferent between them and the uh, higher is the value of utility, we have a preference over the alternative with lower level of utility in that very way, you see. So uh, important part of the story is that when we say about indifference relation and when I have indifference relation, for instance, uh, for me, A, B and C are indifferent. You see, I don't have preferences among them. So an indifference relation is transitive. And about this very uh, specific property, I will tell in the next lecture. But just for you to have a, to get an idea, if A and B, I'm indifferent between A and B, between B and C, I have to be indifferent between B and C. And uh, this is a weak order organized in that way. And there is a more particular case of a weak order, which is called linear order, where in each this class, we have only one alternative, which means that it is a total comparison. A is better than B, B is better than C, etc. You see, I have total ordering uh, um, among alternatives, okay? Professor, can I ask one thing? Yes, sure, sure, yeah. please. So what does this uh, red arrows are showing here? Sorry? The red arrows you have shown, so what does this that is mean? A prefer this is a preference. So it, sa it says it's going that, downwards, right? Or is it? Yes, yes, yes. You see, because okay. utility here is lower than lower. utility okay. here, yeah. So we have from each point from here, we have preference to here. This is just showing that I have from A to this alternative, from this alternative to this one, and we have all these arcs from these alternatives to these ones. Okay. Naturally, I could not uh, draw all these arcs. Okay. okay, is it clear? This is very important for our next uh, slides. If you have questions, please ask. So, uh, Professor Aliskarov, I have one question. Yes, please. So, the way you have defined the preference relation P through the equivalent, is it the case that the indifference is being defined as X and Y not comparable under P, not related under P? 
Yeah, you will see it in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. you will see it in a minute. So, P is a weak order. It satisfies the condition of irreflexivity, which means that X is not comparable with itself. It cannot be better than itself, right? It is transitive. If X is better than Y and Y is better than Z, X should be better than Z, okay? And negatively transitive, I told you about uh, this uh, in the previous slide, that if X is not better than Y and Y is not better than Z, X cannot be better than Z, okay? This is so-called negative transitivity condition and indifference relation is defined as this very difference between A square and P union PD is inverse relation, which means the following. You see, it is really in incomparability means or indifference relation means that I cannot say A is better than B or B is better than A, okay? So that's all. And for weak order, important part of the story, that P is transitive, uh, sorry, IP. In difference relation, naturally P is transitive, it is written here, but IP in difference relation is all, all, uh, also transitive. This is very important part of the classic theory. Um, sir, one question. Yes, yes could please. You, sir, could you please explain that uh, last point again, the IP? Uh, relation that you define what is PD there? PD is inverse relation. P, if XY belongs to P, uh, YX belongs to PD. Okay? Got it, yeah. So, as I told you, neither X is better than Y nor Y is better than X. Okay, okay, I understand now. Okay. So, now we, I would like to switch to the logic of choice functions. They also um, uh, were introduced at the beginning of 20th century and was actively, first time I think, actively used by Paul Samuelson in his famous uh, article um, of 1938 in Economica. Um, so again, we have, where is it? Yes. Uh, the set of alternatives A, we have a presentation X, which is subset of A, okay. Binary preference relation is subset of A square, as we told. Utility function is the mapping of A into R plus, uh, in one dimensional. And choice function is the mapping of the subsets of A into subsets of A such that, that for any x, c of x is the subset of x. That is what I choose should be inside x. Very good uh, rationale or understanding of this is that when we come to the shop and choose for, to choose something, yogurts for, for example, we choose from the set of presented in this shop yogurts. You understand? We cannot choose in this very shop shop yogurt which is not there. So this is the very idea of this um, choice function. And the classic, again, understanding of what is rational choice is based on the two most important paradigms in choice theory, which are really uh, spread into economics, psychology, decision theory, etc that we, when we choose alternatives, here it is, from the set X, we choose those alternatives for which there is no such X which is better than Y. So if we choose Y, in this very set, there is no alternative which is better than Y for me, you see. Naturally, in this case, I would prefer to choose X, right? Or equivalently, not, well, not equivalently, uh, it, it should be very, uh, a bit accurate, another rational choice model that we choose alternative Y 
for which there is no such x, utility of which is higher than utility of y. And this is the key points in classic theory or in classic microeconomics, classic uh, um, decision analysis, etc. Is it clear? Yeah. Professor, can just one clarification. In the second formation of Cx, so it is implicitly assumed that the P relation is weak order, right? Because you have just no. said that. No. no, 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 no. If it is equivalent, Oh, okay. So they could be different as well. Case, okay. In this case, as the theorem says that they should be, and you will see it uh, uh, a bit later. Uh, okay. okay, 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 okay. Yeah. A uh, very fundamental principle of analysis of choice functions is based on so-called, this is, um, this very um, name was given by my teacher, uh, and very good friend, Professor Mark Eisermann, uh, and uh, our colleague Andrei Maryshevsky, to the very principle, the paradigm, how we choose the rationality, the fundamental rationality principle. And the idea is the following. Uh, it is called Condorcet principle of pairwise comparison. It consists of two conditions, con minus and con plus. Con minus said the following, if x belongs to the choice, this means that x passes all comparisons on pairwise form, you see? Which means that, you see, there is no such a subset x, y in which y will be chosen and c not, uh, and x not, you understand? So if we choose x from the larger set x, x should pass all comparisons on pairwise uh, choices. And con plus for any y in x, x, if x passes all comparisons, then x, oh sorry, it should be x capital, then x belongs to x, c of x capital, okay? Uh, sorry, uh, well, is it clear? Yes, yes. And then after this publication of Samuelson work in 1938, in 1950s and later, uh, there were uh, actively used other, con uh, other conditions, which says about this rationality of choice. Uh, and let me uh, explain you, there are only main uh, four of them, and then we will introduce and discuss other conditions. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> the first condition is heredity. It is called in different, where is it? Yes. In different uh, books, etc., it is called in a different form. It was used first time by a uh, professor of Stanford University uh, of uh, Chernov in 54, Arrow used it in 59, Kenneth Arrow, Amartya Sen used it in 74, and Amartya Sen called it alpha condition. But <clears throat> uh, I use here the uh, words, the names introduced by Eisenman and Moliszewski because you see, uh, naturally, many people, when they introduce new conditions, they don't think about uh, the meaning. Uh, they naturally they uh, think about the meaning, but in the notation, they don't think. This is a uh, good thing uh, uh, to call it heredity because it says the following. For any x prime in x, if x is chosen from a larger set, x should be chosen from the smaller set in which x belongs, x small belongs. Very good example for this very condition, heredity condition, is the following. If x capital is the championship of, let's say, swimming in uh, all Asia, okay, and x is the champion in this, then if x prime is the champion, ship uh, competition in India, 
the person who was a champion in all Asia championship should be champion in the Indian competition. You understand? Naturally, you can tell me that, well, it depends on many factors. This day, it, uh, the person might be in a good shape, another day, bad shape. But this is, these are rationality conditions saying how rational choice should be, uh, should work, you see. Another condition is concordance, again used by these people, where is it, yes. It says the following, if I choose X from X prime and X double prime, we have to choose X from their union of these two sets. Again, good example might be the following. Suppose I would like to send somebody to the, some child to the competition, uh, some student to the competition of mathematical economics. X prime is uh, championship in mathematics, X double prime in economics. If this X, this student, student is uh, champion in mathematics and economics, naturally he should be chosen from union of these two sets, okay? <clears throat> Outcast, it was used by Chernov and Sen again. In fact, Amartya Sen did a fundamental impact to, um, let's say, to put all this theory from very separated, fragmented uh, science to a very integ integral one. And then idea of this, <clears throat> the, the definition of this very condition is the following. If X prime belongs to the set X minus chosen subset, Okay, so X prime is inside the bad alternatives in the set X, okay? Then if we delete these alternatives from the set X, the uh, chosen elements will not be changed. You understand? If we erase bad elements, not uh, preferable elements, I mean, not, no, not good, uh, I didn't. I shouldn't use this word, we don't have here preference. We observe the choice. So if we have a part of this set which is not chosen and we erase it, on the rest we have to choose the same good things. So that alternatives should not influence <coughs> my decision <coughs> on uh, choice to choose good, <coughs> sorry. Finally, we have Arrow's choice axiom. Uh, John Nash used it as um, in his bargaining theory. Chernov used it, Arrow used it in 59. And the idea is the following, you see. If X is, uh, X prime is a subset of X, and this is, this is for any X prime and X, X prime is a subset of X. If C of X, which means, my choice is empty, I rejected to choose something, then the choice on the subset should be empty as well. Otherwise, if this very intersection is not empty, so the best alternatives in X intersected with X prime is not empty, then the choice of X prime is exactly this very intersection. Okay? So, Returning back to the heredity condition, we, what we say is that if X is chosen, X should be chosen, right? But we can add something more. Here, this is stronger condition, and it says that exactly these very things were chosen, they will be chosen in, from this intersection, no more. So it is more um, narrow condition. Okay, is it clear? I can go further then. Is this also called the independence axiom? Independence of no, the no, no. Order? It is no, no, no. It is not arrow independence. It is different thing. Maybe if Arunava would invite me to give a lecture on social choice, then I will explain what is uh, uh, independence of irrelevant alternatives in social choice. No, it is not independence in that sense. Professor, the the axiom of outcast 
yes. isn't that that axiom is independent from irrelevant yeah uh, no 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 it is irrelevant <clears throat> but not <clears throat> sorry not in terms of irrelevant in terms of kenes arrow irrelevant alternatives oh, okay <clears throat> so it is just mm. for we consider now in these very lectures today mm. and, <clears throat> and the day after tomorrow sorry <clears throat> Um, um, in this very lectures, we consider only individual choice. I will not go to uh, uh, social choice. Okay. <clears throat> and, no, but uh, what I had in mind was the uh, Nash bargaining uh, solution. I mean, there is also an independence action there, right? Yeah, that is exactly. This is a very independence action mm. in mm. Nash bargaining solution. Yes, absolutely. I didn't get your point. Uh, in the, I thought about independence in mm. terms of uh, arrows independence. No, it, it is exactly independence action in terms of er, uh, Nash independence. Yes. Okay. And then we can uh, prove the theorem, uh, which is in fact can be uh, shown as error Venn diagrams in the space of choice functions. If we consider that we have all these places a space of choice function, okay, then H heredity has non empty intersection with O and C, concordance and outcast, con minus embraces h con plus embraces s and <clears throat> this very part and this is a theorem and it is not our theorem it is not my theorem it was known much before uh maybe first time i don't remember exactly maybe first time it was even proved by arrow himself uh this very part uh, consists of choice functions which satisfies Arrow's choice axiom and it, it are rationalized by weak order oops, sorry, or by utility function uh, in terms exactly in terms which I gave before. Okay. This very intersection H, C, and O is rationalized by partial order or equivalently it gives us Pareto optimal choice okay here <clears throat> if we add additional property of uh, non-empty choice then any point from here which what, the, what does it mean any point any point means any choice function from here is rationalized by a arbitrary acyclic relation rationalized in this very terms that this very choice function which is <clears throat> uh, belongs to this intersection h and c can be represented in this very form with p being acyclic relation okay and others are the same you see here is aca or weak order or utility function etc is it clear? Uh, there is a question uh, in yes, this please. box. Uh, what is Pareto optimal choice? Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't present it. I thought that, okay. Pareto optimal choice is the following. You see, we have not one criterion, not one utility function, but several. For instance, you go to choose yogurt, yes, and you consider fat, price, I don't know, the date, etc. And you choose the alternative which is good <clears throat> uh, with respect to uh, if you compare two alternatives their criterial values should be the same for every criteria except of one in which x will be better than y at least by one criterion and all others being the, being equal that is Pareto optimal choice okay it is a classic again definition. We will come to this uh, in the next lecture. I didn't think that. Uh, uh, okay, well, okay. professor. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just one clarification. What is the difference between this uh, H 
intersection C, intersection O, and this ACA, the 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 special sub part yes. of ACA. Here you mean? Yeah. So ACA, you have said that weak order. So it's even the refinement of the partial order. But here is partial order because mm -hmm. ACA is stronger than each of these three. You see, see, it is mm -hmm. inside of, this of that. intersection. Mm -hmm. So it is more narrow. More narrow. And, and then we come to the uh, very important part of the story when we have single value choice. Here we allow uh, people to choose several alternatives. In old classic series, it was a uh, restriction that people choose always one alternative, one alternative. And in this case, it turns out that H, O, and ACA becomes equivalent. Okay. And this is the uh, uh, area in Euler Venn diagram. And C, our concordance embraces this very part. It is for single value choice. Okay. This is a very fundamental thing. We have a book with Eisenman, uh, which is called Theory of Choice. And all this stuff uh, was explained there and very accurately with all proofs, etc. But now let's go a bit further ahead and try to understand <clears throat> you understand that we have here uh, all, all classic theory in fact is here you see rationalization by utility function or by weak order all classic series here a bit extension it is also considered as classic is here in this intersection of three of these ideas, okay? A bit more extension also known is here, okay? But nobody thought about what will be here, here, or here, or here, you understand? And our goal was to construct understanding of all this. <clears throat> uh, what does it mean, for instance, rational choice function, which satisfies only H? how we can represent this choice function. And this kind of questions we might ask a lot and we would like to answer these very questions. And just to give you one very, uh, how can I say, example which, is, which shows a lot is the example of M superior alternatives on linear order. Suppose we have, <clears throat> the um, alternate uh, um, ordering of alternatives, strict ordering, linear order, and all alternatives are comparable. You see, A is better than B, B is better than C, etc. Naturally transitive. And suppose I do like to choose not one alternative, the best one in the each, each subset, but for instance, three alternatives. I would like to, you, you can imagine this very choice as follows, you see. I choose among the projects and I bring these three projects to the commission and commission says which, and final step, which one to choose, okay? Or my wife asked me to buy a jam and I forgot which jam to buy. I brought three gems and said, this is what, what I choose. And naturally I choose top three alternatives, the best for me, okay? Is it clear? So yeah. there is a theorem. Choice of M superior alternatives, what is it? Yeah. M, for instance, three, etc. satisfies con minus, and H and O, and satisfies con plus in only two cases. If we choose only top alternatives, M is one, or we choose all set. Every time we choose all set, which is not interesting case. 
look here, what does this mean? That <clears throat> if we choose this M, M alternatives, we are here, okay. But if we would like to be here or here, to be here, then we have to choose either top alternative or everything, which is not in, uh, in case of M is equal to one, it's a classic, <coughs> sorry, classic choice uh, of top alternatives, undominated alternative. And this is not interesting case when we choose everything. There is another example <coughs> uh, introduced by Eiserman and Malyshevsky in 81, and it uh, works as follows. Suppose we have, <coughs> in terms of uh, individual choice, we have several criteria. I choose according to fat, according to price, etc. Okay, and each my yogurts are <coughs> um, well um, ordered by linear order. By fat, A is better than B, better than C. By price, C is better than A, B, etc. What I do, I do the following. I choose optimal elements according to each linear order here. You see, yes. And then I unify them. We call it, they called it joint extremal choice. Okay. Is it clear? If you have questions, better ask. So, as in, we are choosing uh, all those elements uh, from X. Uh, sorry. Which are, uh, so, we are choosing all those elements from X. Uh, yes. Uh, which <coughs> perform maximally according to at least one criteria, right? Yes, according to at least one grade, yes. Uh, according to at least one order, yes, absolutely. And then unify them. Uh, then we come to this following theorem proved by Azerman and Malyshevsky that C is rationalizable by joint extremal choice model if and only if. C satisfies intersection of H and O. Look here. This very, understand? This very part got a complete explanation. Or we, uh, it turned out it is equivalent to pass independent choice function, which was introduced by a friend of mine, Charlie Platt. Uh, many years ago in 74, I think, 70, yes, something like that, 74. And pass independent choice function is the following idea. It, it is very important also idea that we choose, uh, we might choose sequentially, you see, from the choice of one part, another part, and choose as from the total set and it should be the same, you understand? It does not depend how we split this uh, set to parts, choose, and it will be the same as the choice, unify them, and then it will be the same as uh, the choice from general case. Okay. Uh, one question, uh, Fuad. Yes, so uh, it, you are actually going to you're going to construct the CIs right in the other direction from H intersection O to uh, you're going to construct the 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 eyes right the components. We don't know how many and so on. You're going to construct them. Am I correct? Is it the construction uh, of PIs? No, I will not. I will not work here in this area. There is a theory about it, how to construct it, etc. But I will not go in this very direction. I will go in an, a bit other direction to show it's very interesting theory we can develop on this very way. But in fact, it is also it is very interesting problem. You said uh, it is related, uh, and I did it in one of my first scientific works in 7980, uh, it is uh, connected with the uh, um, 
so-called very famous mathematical problem of uh, dimen dimension of partial order. Uh, and it was uh, partly resolved by me in, uh, and it was published in the book. You see, in old times, I never thought about that to publish everything in the article. You see, I thought that if it is published in the book, it's enough. Uh, today, we should change our views. So I had a question. Uh, uh, so, in the other direction, suppose C satisfies H and O, uh, then is there any bound on the number of CIs required to rationalize it? I mean, uh, yeah, very good question. Very good question. In fact, you see, it is possible. Uh, let me tell you in that way. You can find all this explanation in the book. It is possible to construct in this case a very special partial order, and the bound is the dimension of this partial order. Okay. okay. In fact, you see, we can do it in a bit higher dimension, but the minimal dimension is defined by the dimension of partial order. I see. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Professor, uh, one yes. silly, one silly clarification. Throughout the presentation, we are assuming that A is finite. Yes. The yes. Set of yes. is finite. Yes. Yes. In Thank fact, you. again, I would like to say that in some cases, you see, when you um, apply this counters uh, separability property or some special topologies. You can resolve these problems, you see, but there is no complete and general theory about all this stuff, you see, for okay. in infinite cases. Okay. Uh, by the way, it is an open question to um, to construct such a uh, uh, closed theory, like for finite case. But in fact, you see uh, how to work in this direction, it is more or less obvious. Okay. Okay. Now I would like to go to explanation of this joint extremal choice in ter uh, in the, for the case of two criteria, two utility functions, okay? Suppose we have X, Y, and Z organized in that very way in the space of these two utility functions, okay? According to our theory in the x y for instance what we will choose one x is uh, ex, uh, external point by u2 y is external point by u1 so we choose x y right we choose separate external points and then unify them right x z x z will be chosen both right for the same reason, and in YZ we will choose both, okay? But what we will choose in XYZ, we will not choose Y. Extremal by U2 is X, by U1 is Z, so we choose. And you understand that we come to the contradiction, very important part of the story, with Condorcet principle. Condorcet principle says the following, if y passes the comparison in both sets x, y, and y, z, then it should be chosen in the greater set, right? We violated very important rationality property. Or the same story is with concordance. Concordance is the same idea, right? But we violated it and we came out of this very uh, rationality properties like S or con plus. How we can explain this? We cannot say that X dominate Y because in X, Y it is chosen. We cannot say Z dominates Y, uh, y yes, because in Y, Z, why is chosen. The only idea comes that the set wise domination of alternative. You understand? That if we have this set XZ, then we have a domination of alternative Y. Is it clear? This is very important and crucial 
point to go to the new new theory. So is it like yes please uh can i ask yes sure yeah. yeah so is it like now we are saying that we have to talk about comparison of sets instead of alternatives yeah we will come in a minute we will come to this very story but you, you understand that this very simple example of joint extramal choice violates the fundamental principles of classic theory Condorcet uh, um, uh, uh, plus condition. Yes. So, and how we can go further, we can go, we have to change a paradigm, right? And let's, and this very example gives us a hint that we come to the situation when set dominates alternative. Okay, then we, instead of preferences, we will introduce so-called hyperrelations. Exactly what you said, that we have the gamma is a hyperrelation, which is a subset of two power A to two power A. And it says about the preferences among sets. And unilateral hyperrelation, uh, very particular part, very specific part of general hyperrelation is the subset of this Decartian, uh, Cartesian product in which set dominates alternative. Okay. And here is the example. I'm sorry, again, you see it's, uh, some kind of We have, suppose we have this very uh, set subset X out of X1, X6. We have this very subset, looks this very hyper relation. And our gamma is X3, X4 dominates X6. And for X3, X4, X5, let's look X3, X4, X5. Okay. Uh, this very X, we don't have any gamma here which dominates something, okay? And then we can, after we introduce these very properties, is it clear? Uh, please do not hesitate to ask questions. It is too important thing. It is, in fact, a new paradigm in choice model. And we will talk about other paradigms later on. I decided to give you the very, uh, how can I say, very uh, wide landscape of these uh, new models. Please, if you have questions, ask. The last point is not clear to me. This X3, X4, X5, uh, what happened? Yeah, uh, we, we don't have uh, in this very set X3, X4, X5, we don't have any domination that this very set dominates something. And in terms of notation, what is it saying on the right hand side? Uh, this is gamma minus x is equal to none. No, it is not uh, minus. It is a contraction of gamma to x. Contraction. A, a restriction? Uh, yes, restriction, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's go further and now we, we are completely free to introduce some specific properties of uh, this very um, uh, hyper relations. And first property which I would like to introduce, you know the classic property of, uh, where is it? No, sorry. Uh, Is it? Yeah. Classic property of acyclicity means the following. I cannot say that X is better than Y, Y is better than Z, Z is better than X, right? This would mean that I am irrational. If I say X is better than Y, Y is better than Z, 
I might say in some cases that X and Z for me, uh, I don't know whether they, which one is preferable, but I cannot say Z is better than X, you see. It is violation of rationality. And so a secrecy uh, plays very important role in this theory. But in hyperrelation, never was such kind of things introduced. And then let us introduce strong hyperacyclicity. It is the following. There are no sets book here and alternatives, you see, these pairs, which are organized as follows. Union of all these P sets is inside this very set of alternatives. And then in this, this very gamma is organized as follows. X1, sorry. X1 dominates X2. Set X2 dominates X3. And we go in this very way and final set XP dominates X1. So we have a, we have cycle in terms of sets and elements, you understand? We call it strong hyperacyclicity. And the first theorem is the following. The set of functions which satisfies heredity is completely defined as by unilateral hyperrelation gamma. Where is it? Yes and strongly dominant choice rule. That is, we choose alternatives y from x, such that there is, there is no a set from two power x, from the subset of x, such that this very set dominates my gamma, uh, my y, sorry. Exactly what we said in this very, case, you understand? There are no such kind, uh, no. In fact, you see, in this very sense dominates, but we don't have cycle and the theorem is the following. Theorem says that C choice function belongs to heredity if and only if it is rationalizable by strongly hyper acyclic unilateral gamma and strongly dominant rule, exactly this one. What this means, this very theorem? In fact, let's go back to this very picture. We described every choice functions fr function from this set. Whatever choice function satisfies heredity, we say that we can construct uh, unilateral gamma, unilateral gamma, yes, which satisfies strong hyperacyclicity, and by using this very rule, we can choose alternatives. You understand? We switch to the fundamental one paradigm to another one. In classic paradigm of choice, we, what we said, we said that we have to compare alternatives uh, by pairs and choose the best, yes? The condition H, which says us that, uh, condition H, which says us that it is rationality condition in terms of how this organizes the chosen alternatives, we can represent it, but not with preference relation P, but gamma, hyperrelation. And what are conditions? Conditions that this gamma should be strongly hyperacyclic, and we can choose this very rule, which is very similar to our classic rule. You remember? Here it should be x small here p y right but now it is set which dominates y is it clear 
Yes. Uh, so completely change a paradigm. Yes, please. So, so if we impose in addition O, then these V's will boils down to singletons. Very good. Uh, no, not singleton, but we will come to this a bit. Okay. A bit uh, very good. Uh -huh. The example Is that it? you showed uh, that violates the acyclicity condition that you just introduced. Sorry. The example that you mentioned violates this acyclicity condition. Yes. Okay. okay. So Is, we... uh, I have one question. Yes, please. Is it possible in the new paradigm to ask what is the analog of the Condorcet principle? No, here Condorcet principle does not work, you see, because we violated, uh, 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 it works Condorcet uh, minus, but not Condorcet plus, you see, That's because so we, we came to this very, uh, look, we are, uh, where is it? We are here. You see, so we were uh, in fact in the case of Condorcet minus, but not here. And when we come to the intersection, I will show you what we will have. Now, weak hyperacyclicity says the following. Uh, it is the same idea. I will not uh, spend too much time to this because we have many things to discuss. But here, V of X is a subset of elements of X of uh, two power X such that X I belongs to V. So you understand you fix X I and take all subsets of X which contains uh, X, X I. And then it says the following, look here. It should not be the case, then we have again this cycle, but cycle much more complicated that at least one of them dominate here, uh, x2. From here dominates x3, and then we come to uh, from xp dominates x1. In the previous case, we have that only one should not dominate. Here we have not all of them should dominate this very case. That is the story of hyper, uh, uh, weak hyper acyclicity. Look here, what is it? X, Y, the set X, Y, look, dominates Z, right? The set Y, Z dominates X, okay? And the set X, Z dominates Y. And this creates us weak, hypercycle and uh, this is very important story because we have another rule weakly dominant rule that y is chosen if there is no x such that that for every subset from this two power x if x belongs to v v dominates y then we prove the theorem that C belongs to concordance if choice function is rationalizable by unilateral weak hyperacyclic gamma and this very weakly dominant rule. You understand what we did? We again a bit change a paradigm. If the previous paradigm looks very similar to our classic paradigm, but instead of alternative, we had here set right here we have a system oops sorry system of sets you see and the system of sets should not be y okay and finally uh i'm sorry here should be two power x capital uh, it's not small x it is two power x capital and now i would like to come to the third case. But first I would like to introduce the set of dominants of X with respect to Y. 
And this is the set of sets y's. It is power, two power x capital. I'm sorry, it is, when I copied it from another um, presentation, it was uh, changed, I don't know why, to small one. So there is no V in this power set such that V dominates gamma. Again, we come, but now we come to the relation between sets, you understand? And we call this D, or uh, sorry, gamma is called correct if D has a power, uh, um, cardinality of D is equal to one for any X. You understand why it is uh, given? Imagine that we have this very complicated structure on the sets, domination of, of sets, but when you consider some set X capital, and if you have two undominated sets in this very structure, which this means that we don't know what to do, what is the choice, okay? So this very condition says that always in each subset, this undominated set should be only one. And hyperdominant rule is the following. C of X is equal to Y if this very D is equal to Y, the set of dominants, okay? So it is, again, looks very much like uh, our classic rule, but instead of X small and uh, X small and small Y, we have a P pi here, P, P here, we have here subsets. And that is a theorem that C belongs to outcast if it is rationalizable by gamma and hyper dominant rule. Okay? Naturally, uh, this, the set of dominants should be correct. Okay? Sir, if we have cardinality of D greater than one, then what goes wrong in this proof? Okay. But in this case, we don't know what to choose, you see. We have to, in every set, we have the system of domination among subsets such that there should be one subset which is the best. That is the story behind it. And it is very general case, you see, and outcast. Uh, uh, I don't know to which extent you... Uh, uh, are, uh, you know, algebra, but if we go to the algebraic properties of this, I just, I, I will tell one just phrase. Uh, if we go to the algebraic properties of this, this very, uh, this very um, uh, system, uh, this uh, correctness, in fact, means uh, transitivity on this very set of, uh, system of sets, you understand? It is very interesting and we can go further and further and look here. Now we can go to these subsets, subdomains, H we know, O we know, and then we can explain, it was a question, somebody asked me what it will be if we add O. There is an answer. We call gamma to be hypertransitive if for any y z in, in A, let me explain you it, it by um, um, figure. So what it says, suppose we have, uh, it is not very well seen. This is my z, look here. Can you see it? Yes, yes. yes, yes. This is my z, z dominates y, okay? Y belongs to the set, this one, Y, and it dominates X, okay? Then it says that it should be some W here in this very union, such that it will dominate X. So it is exactly the very idea of transitivity, but on the subsets, you understand? Subsets and elements. And naturally we have, 
very important uh, theorem that we are in this very intersection if this C is rationalizable by hypertransitive gamma and strong dominant rule. Strong dominant rule is here, you remember? So addition of O, when we add outcast, we immediately come to this very idea of hypertransitivity, uh, preserving strong dominant rule. You understand that it gives us a lot of, let's say, freedom in terms of explaining this rationality of choice functions through these very interesting cases. And uh, yeah, uh, if you have questions, please ask. I have one question. Yes, please. So this hypertransitivity seems to be stronger than the transitivity that you were referring in the previous theorem, right? Where, where you talked about the cor correctness of gamma. No, but uh, it's that very, uh, uh, ah, I understood what you said. No, no, it is not stronger. In fact, stronger, yes, in terms of because it relates with uh, unilateral uh, uh, model. Yes, unilateral gamma. Yeah, in this sense, it's stronger. Yes, right. But is there anything else going on in terms of comparability between the two notions? Uh, sorry, uh, I didn't get... Uh, in terms of comparability of these two notions, transitivity there and hypertransitivity here. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, can you clarify the, the relation a little bit more? I mean, I, I mean, if there is something more to be said. Uh, yeah, well, uh, not uh, to, today. I did not uh, think about that. We have to. Uh, I can clarify it, but uh, the whole theory is written in the book, and I didn't like to go too deep to these very cases. But the very idea is that. Sorry, I will close the window. It is something very noisy here. Okay. The very idea of transitivity in classic case, you remember, we have X is better than Y, Y is better than Z, then X should be better than Z. What we get here in terms of hypertransitivity, that if one set beats some element, yes, the set in which this element to which this element belongs beats another element, then in the union of these two sets should be some uh, set which beats that very uh, last element X. You see, it is the idea which goes far ahead from the classic transitivity, but it really, uh, let me explain you also in another uh, way. Uh, explain you in another way. Um, suppose we now would like to add here uh, this very um, concordance condition. Then this very transitivity reduced to classic transitivity. You understand? Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Because because this uh, goes in a very interesting way, and in the book you can find everything about this uh, in very detailed manner. Uh, I, I will have it. I, I didn't have. Uh, I, uh, you see, since it's only two lectures, and I have to give you the very wide landscape of the field. Uh, I didn't have in mind to give you let's say deep very neat things including proofs etc so that is the one direction in which we went uh, uh, in terms of ex how to explain the choice models this very choice models in terms of uh, uh, somehow explain and we understood uh, that 
this very thing, all classic theory about utilities, preferences, where is it here? Is here. A bit more general is here, and a bit more general is here. That's all. You see, nobody went to these very directions. And if we add these very uh, conditions, I mean, uh, if we consider these conditions separately, we, it turned out that we cannot explain these models in terms of classic models of choice. We have to apply, we have to uh, refer to these hyper relations, relations in terms of uh, sets uh, are preferred to sets or sets preferred to um, uh, alternatives, like in this very case where we were, like in this very case. And it was constructed a complete theory for these very cases. But now I would like to go a bit further. Yeah, here. In, in the, uh, because you see, I would like to- What, you uh, have about 10 minutes, is that okay? Uh, how many minutes? 10. 10, no, I will finish a bit earlier. In five okay. minutes, I will finish. Okay. Look here, uh, we talk about uh, in the very beginning of the lecture, we, call, uh, we talk about in the very classic model that indifference relation is always transitive, right? Uh, but uh, there were many examples at the uh, first time at the beginning of um, 20th century. You know, this very uh, dating of artifacts, archaeological artifacts by radiocarbon method, right? Uh, if you consider this very method, you will get not exact date, for instance, it this very artifact is 5,000 years old. No, it says 5,000 plus minus 300 or 500 years old, etc. But I would like to give you another example. In fact, first time the very idea of this example was introduced by Poincaré, very famous French uh, mathematician. But in this very form, it was first uh, presented by uh, Richard Duncan Hughes, uh, a great, absolutely specialist in decision analysis. His book, uh, Games and Decisions, uh, was very influential in 1950s, you see, in developing of um, uh, game theory and many, many other things. I will talk about some of his results later on. No, uh, next lecture, I mean. But this is the very idea of the example which he presented <coughs> um, in his article in Econometrica, I think. Uh, uh, no, it is in Econometrica, but I think it was 50, 1956. Um, Suppose we compare two glasses of coffee and in one we put no sugar and in another one we put one gram of sugar, which means one fortieth of milligram, which means nothing. Naturally, I cannot say that, I cannot see the, uh, feel the difference, right? Too, too small amount. If we compare the coffee with one gram of sugar and two grams of sugar, again, we cannot uh, feel the difference, right? Too small. But then by transitivity of indifference, I can say that I cannot compare, I'm indifferent between the sh coffee with no sugar and two grams of sugar, right? Then going by this, I come to the situation when, for instance, uh, there is no sugar and coffee with, I don't know, 50 grams of sugar, I should say that they're incomparable, which is not true, right? 
that is a story. And it shows that in some cases, indifference cannot be transitive. And another example, in 1938, uh, Paul Samuelson, uh, by the way, I was introduced to him uh, when I was very young and was in the America, but at that time I didn't know who he is <laughs> because I'm a mathematician, not economist. Uh, the, uh, he published in 1938 very fundamental work uh, uh, in um, Economica journal concerning these choice functions about the classic, and we will talk about his work in the next lecture. And a uh, uh, in 1938, Armstrong published an article criticizing exactly this very idea of uh, indifference, transitivity of indifference. And he uh, uh, presented an example that parents would like to present to child either bicycle or horse, pony, small horse, right? And child is indifferent between horse and bicycle, but if it is bicycle, he would prefer bicycle with ring to the bicycle without ring. But he's indifferent between pony and bicycle. Then what we will have, my God, my God. Bicycle with ring is indifferent to bicycle with, uh, to pony. Pony is indifferent to bicycle without ring, but bicycle with ring is more preferable than bicycle without ring, which means that we have a violation of transitivity of indifference, and we will talk about it next lecture, and it will it will be another direction is in this very series. Thank you very much. I stop here and I am ready to respond to your questions. Okay, so uh, uh, any questions? Uh, can I go for one? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, sir, sir, please go ahead. So this uh, transitivity of the indifference is stemming from the fact that we have been working with the weak order as the primitive in today's yeah. lecture. Right? It, it stems from the fact, in fact, more, more serious fact, when we try to express all the stuff in this very form, yes, we cannot go uh, outside transitivity of indifference, you see. In this very case, we have the um, partition of the set of alternatives to equivalence classes, it's called in algebra, equivalence classes, and each equivalence class is more preferable than another equivalence class, lower equivalence class. But inside equivalence class, we have uh, transitivity of indifference. That is the story. Uh, we cannot represent it uh, by other, uh, in other way. And uh, if we go even to, uh, it is absolutely the same case with, with, with when we have a countable sets for infinite case counter proved that this is, um, uh, we, we, we should add so-called uh, separability, uh, separability axiom, you see, and then we have the same structure. Thank you. So Please. I had, uh, you know, one, um, uh, you know, general uh, question. So, you know, um, you know, you define these hyper relations about how to compare sets and alternatives. What if we tried uh, something like this? We say that X is better than y in the presence of some other set right yeah. so again we have an order over over alternatives but we index it with a set and yeah. then we try and and do those things um, you know try and get counterparts of what satisfies h and o and this and that combinations of those things 
Yeah, Aronawa, is this very good question? Let us wait for the next lecture. Okay. okay. And okay. I will I will exactly go through this very direction, okay. but uh, we don't we did not uh, represent it in terms of hyperrelations. There is another representation, okay. and we will discuss it uh, next lecture. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. And Professor Alaskarov, I mean, the yes. book that you have been referring to for uh, more details, is it the one uh, which you wrote with uh, Professor Eisenman? Yes, that is exactly the uh, book which we wrote with Mark Eisenman. And uh, also next lecture, I will talk about the models which are presented in the book which we wrote with uh, Boisseau, Monjardet and me. Uh, I was responsible for all these cl non-classic models. They took care about classic models. Okay, so it is uh, called Utility Maximization, Choice and Preference. It was published second edition, I think, in 2007 in Springer. Uh, and I will give you these references next, next uh, lecture, after next lecture. Okay. Yeah, actually, we have circulated. Thank you. Your, uh, with your lecture squad. The lectures that you sent to uh, the books and references that you sent, uh, I think they are, uh, you know, in the notification for your lecture, uh, for your lectures, uh, you know, those references are given. Uh, ah, so okay, good. Good. Okay, so, some other questions, please. Okay, uh, Mridu, uh, uh, so uh, there is a question. C uh, can you please explain the unilateral gamma once again? Yes, sure. Somebody else. Yes. Uh, let me start from here. And again, you see, if we go back to this, is a joint external choice. Yes, okay. we have to choose out of every pair. We we choose both of them. Right? But when we consider X, Y, Z, we choose only X and Z as extremal uh, points in by U1 and by U2. Then it, this very story contradicts the very idea of Condorcet principle in terms of Condorcet plus. When element passes comparison, through all subsets, it should be chosen in the whole set. Why it is the case? The only answer is that in this case, the set XZ dominates alternative Y. And then we introduce this unilateral hyperrelation in which the set V dominates Y. And that is the very idea and then Oops, sorry. Then we introduce this strongly dominant choice rule, which is very similar to the classic rule, but instead of here it had to be X small and here it had to be preference relation. But now we have instead of, in a sense, this unilateral, oops, sorry. Unilateral relation is, uh, in a sense, a counterpart of preference relation, but here we allow sets to beat alternatives, to be more preferable. Set might be more preferable than an alternative, like in this very example above, okay? And then we construct this idea, um, uh, not idea, but we, uh, introduce this idea of strong hyperacyclicity and prove theorem that it is it works like this. Okay, is it clear? Um, clear? Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that was a question via chat. Uh, let me see. I think. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So it is. Uh, yeah. He says it's clear. So. Um, um, so, so Fuad, I had one more suggestion. Uh, you, uh, you know, at the end of your lecture, perhaps the next lecture, if you could share, uh, if you could share your, um, 
your Pres slides. Uh, presentations, yes, I will send you. Uh, uh, maybe after the next lecture, or you see, I'm sorry, you see, there are some misprintings here, which I am very okay. sorry about. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, I will try to, to correct it uh, and send you. Okay. Certainly. Okay, so, um, so um, are there any other questions? Um, uh, if not, uh, I, I, I guess it's uh, uh, thank you again, Fuad, for a very nice lecture. And you thank know, you it's, very uh, much. It's a great opportunity for us. And um, so we will meet again on 